Frontier Fighters. Frontier Fighters, exciting adventures in the lives of those famous pioneers who blazed trails in the Old West. Prior to 1860, it took 34 days for Butterfield's Overland Stage to get mail from St. Joseph, Missouri, over the plains and mountains to the Pacific Coast. But now, a national crisis had arisen. Great news concerning North and South was coming out of the capital every day, and such news must travel fast from one coastline to the other. Said Postmaster General Joseph Holt to Mr. Majors of the firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell. The term for the Butterfield Overland stage is approximately 34 days. I think we can cut such time to 24 days. Mr. Majors, you're still thinking in terms of faster stagecoaches. I'm thinking in terms of horses and men. Riders carrying mail pouches, using horses in relays at stages or stations so many miles apart. Pony Express. Mr. Postmaster General, that's a great idea. Now, Mr. Majors, how much better can we do than 34 days from St. Joseph to Sacramento? Mm, Fifteen days, sir. Ten days for the regular schedule, and the contract is yours. We can do it, sir. Good. But I expect the service to be kept on schedule 24 hours a day, irrespective of weather or hazards of any kind. You've my word, sir. When you hire your men, Mr. Majors, you'd better warn them... Uncle Sam expects the mail to go through. Little did the Postmaster General realize that the men hired by Russell, Majors, and Waddell thrived on taking chances. Just before the Pony Express service was opened, there walked into Mr. Majors' office in St. Joseph, Missouri, an amazing boy of 14. Well, Yonker, what's your business? I'm looking for Mr. Majors. Uh, he's pretty busy these days hiring men for the Pony Express. Well, that's just what I come to talk to Mr. Majors about. You? <laughs> I ain't aiming to be laughed at, mister. Or have you make light of my being a man. I'm a veteran rider, trapper, scout, and Indian hey, fighter. Hey, 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 put up those... Sh- uh, put them up, I tell you. Uh, What's going on in here? Uh, well, next time you hire a bookkeeper, you'd better tell him to come armed. Uh, you remember me, Mr. Majors? I was a bullwhacker for you when I was ten years old, out on the old South Platte Trail. Well, you're not little Willie Cody. Say, you put on weight and muscle. How old are you, son? Oh, I'm going on fifteen. Your clerk there got me sore. I, well, I didn't mean to pull a gun, sir. I don't want you to think I'm a killer. Little Willie Cody. <laughs> Say, I, I guess I'd better not call you that now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Majors, do I get a job as Pony Express rider? Uh, unless my age is against me. Bill, it isn't a man's age that's ever against him. It's his metal. You're hired, Bill Cody. Well, I'll not fail you, sir. It's dangerous work, Billy. Two thousand miles of the worst country in the world. Man and beast pounding along at fifteen miles an hour. It'll break some of the riders. That'll be the test of a man, Mr. Majors. <laughs> Pony Express was a race against time. Stations were built 15 miles apart, with a change of horses at each interval. The fleetest horses were used in the lightest, most wiry and experienced riders. 
The messages, written on the thinnest paper, were carried in a waterproof pouch slung under the shooting irons of the rider. Bill Cody's route pushed farther west all the time. The farther west, the more dangerous it became. Galloping into the station at three crossings, Cody found the place in an uproar. His relief rider had just been killed. Just rode right past and picked them off. Well, Cody, looks like you'll have to go right on to Rocky Ridge. Now that's a run of 85 miles. You can count on me. Well, you better turn in. Got about three hours sleep. That means that these dispatches will be three hours late getting into Sacramento at the end of the run. Poor Fred here getting killed is an act of God. Now we can't help that. Well, all I want's a fresh pony. So you're as crazy as a bed bug. That's what you are. You'll kill yourself off on a ride like this. All I want's a fresh pony. How's that California roam? As fresh as a daisy. The fastest in the state. All right. Mark me up for that run to Rock Ridge. You'll have the Indians laying for you. Now in three hours, it'll be morning. Wait. Indians are no Cody, I tell you to wait. This mail is going through. Come on, girl. Come on. Come on. We just got to get through. Oh, oh. Redskins. Come on, girl, we're hell-bent for leather now. Take that, you red devils, you. Take it. All right, girl, it's up to you now. If you're not better than a redskins pony, you're not my horse. That's a girl. We're losing them. Come on, girl. Nose them out. Come on. Half of my lead. Come on, that's a good horse. You show him. Good girl, good horse. We've lost him. Oh, oh, oh. Cody reporting with dispatches. Where's Fred? Killed by Redskins. All right, pass these on to the next rider. Good luck to him. Hey, you crazy fool. You can't ride that horse back to three crossings. That's right, partner. I'm not. I'm riding her back to my own station, Red Buttes. I expect my round trip will be 320 miles, and I think my time will be a little over 21 hours. Well, if he ain't the craziest rider of this whole darn Pony Express, he'll be dead before he's even come of age. Yeah, Jeep is a country from Maine to California under the stars and stripes. William Frederick Cody thrived on danger, and he not alone grew to man's estate, but many years beyond that. The Civil War saw him on the Union side, where he distinguished himself as a scout. After the war, he added more laurels to his crown by scouting for General Sherman and General Custer. This youngster at 20 was a veteran Pony Express rider, soldier, and scout. In 1867, when Bill Cody was 21 years old, he was living near Fort Hayes in Kansas. A captain and four lieutenants newly arrived at the fort spotted a herd of buffaloes. So did Cody. Out after game two, mister? Yes, sir. I spotted them buffalo coming up. We'll just plumb out of fresh meat. <laughs> Expect to catch up with those buffalo on that gothic steed of yours? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean Brigham. Well, he's the best buffalo horse in the West. Yeah, and I suppose you're the best buffalo hunter. Oh, I'm fair to Midland. If I do bring down a bull once in a while, it isn't my fault. I give all the credit to Brigham and my rifle here, the Creature Borgia. Hey, can that thing really shoot? Well, I reckon it does look funny, but it's a breech loading needle gun. I had it made over to suit me. Hey, look, there's the herd. Come on, men. Did you hear all that, Brigham? Well, let's just run in ahead of those eastern dudes and show them up. Captain! You'll excuse me if I take the whole herd. We're pretty hungry at home. Well, look at him go. All right, Brigham. Here goes. Every ten feet of buffalo. One, two, three. Eleven. Twelve. Well done, Brigham. Thank you, Lucrezia Borgia. Stop that man who killed all those buffaloes. Don't let him get away. Stop him. Me? Well, I'm not running away. What's your business, stranger? Oh, hold up there. My name's Goddard. Mine's Cody, William Frederick Cody. You're not Cody, the famous scout and Indian fighter. I've done a little scouting in my day. If you'll excuse me, Captain, I have business with Mr. Cody. Uh, well, if that doesn't beat the dust. Cody, my brother, and I have the contract to feed the men constructing the Kansas Pacific Railroad. We need 12 buffalo a day. 
Now, it's dangerous work because we're building more into Indian country every day. But I'll pay you well. How much will you take? I don't think you'll pay it. Name your price. Well, I know it's too high. $500 a month. It's a deal. I'll give you your chance to take your offer back. Don't want it back. When you, can you start the work? Well, if it's up to me, I'm on the payroll right now. Uh, what's your name again? I'm short of memory. William Frederick Cody. Just call me Bill. All right, sir. I'll tell my brother that I just hired the best hunter in the United States. Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill, through the long life that nature so generously gave to him, often returned to both scouting and Indian fighting. The call of the plains brought him back time and again. He grew lean on civilization, but thrived on danger. The years rolled on. The railroad conquered the plains and desert, yet the Indian remained hostile and bitter to the end. Settlers all through the West were harassed, frightened, and killed. Above all others, the Indians hated the soldiers and their scouts. On the morning of July 17, 1876, General Merritt was called to put down the bloodthirsty Cheyennes. He sent Cody with some soldiers to ascertain their number and see if it was possible to ambush them. General Merritt stood on a promontory watching. There must be a lot of them somewhere about, Cody. Reckon so. There's your Indians. I don't see them yet. You will. Ah, We're drawing them out now. Just as soon as they show color, we see their number, we'll make a run for it. All right, Bill, just as you say, but... Well, I'd rather stay and fight it out with the Cheyenne. There they are. Must be 200 of them. General Merritt should be able to pick out their number now with his glasses. Yeah. There they are out in the open. Oh. There goes my horse. Quick, man. Get to General Merritt. I'll have to put up a stand here. Stay with you, Bill. Oh, get for General Merritt. Don't lose a minute. You're just in time. One minute more and my scouting days would have been over. Here's the horse, Bill. After the man, it'll be a running fight. We'll win. Cody, if we can conquer the Cheyenne, you can take a rest from Indian fighting. I'll not stop fighting Indians until the last frontier in the West is safe for all of us. The day came when the West was safe for all the citizens of the United States. Thanks to such great Indian fighters and scouts as William F. Cody, Buffalo Bill. And so ends a breathtaking moment of history and the story of another frontier fighter.